Hey, I remember what we did one of those tours with Johnny Cash, and we had a meet in Wichita, Texas, and to rehearse because they had Danny and the Juniors going to be there, and we were going to back them. And we walk in, walk in there, and the guy walks in with sheet music and hands it to Gern. He turns it upside down. He back, he said, "Oh, I can't read this." And the guy liked to paint it. And he said, "You play us a record." We'll play it, and that's what we did. I said, now, never seen him take a drink, take easy go for it. Nicest guy you ever seen. Like Elvis, Elvis one of the finest guys you ever want to see. Carl Burton, nobody yeah, played a place called Bob King and Swift in Arkansas. So rock and Roll Highway 67. Yeah, Rock and Roll Highway 67. Got a lot of signs up there now, about And anyway, this they had a guy there from the big town of Egypt, Arkansas, population of 87. He used to make that club all the time, and he was, this guy weighed about 270 pounds, it's like a grill. And he came in there one night, and he wanted to hear us play, and we had just got started playing, and he bought him a big tall beer, he walked up there and had his 50 cents, he said, fellas, I'd like to hear down yonder. So we said, all right, we'll play it for you. We played it, and just as soon as we got through, he said, I really like that, I'll hear some more of it. So we played it again. After that, we started playing another song. He came up there and said, I want to hear some more down young. I really like that song. I said, well, we've already played it. He said, you see this beer? He said, I'm going to crank down to right here. And if I don't hear down yonder time I get to hear, I'm going to clean this band stand off. And let me tell you that we played it a long while. And the club owner come over there and said, what the hell's wrong with y'all? This is the only song you know? I said, no, but it's... This is the only song that's keeping us alive right now. <laughs> Talk to Booker Bear. Rock and Highway is U.S. Highway 67, which runs a long way. Runs in the middle of Arkansas. And back in the 50s, when Bob King had the club, we had, from in Jackson County, we had like 15 different clubs on Highway 67, which is now Rock and Roll Highway 67. And all these guys from Memphis and all around that played music. We had Fox Domino, uh, see Bob Will, the Texas Playboys, the Big Art, Dorsey Brothers, everybody played, like the Silver Moon, uh, most country Bobs. And because, and all the artists and sun artists that played there, Silver Moon and Bob James, Gorgeous Rooftop, and uh, because they could make a little money. Memphis, which it still does. <laughs> and Little Rock would starve the musicians to death. And they're still doing that little thing. You know, hey, yeah, man, you play, but you just, just give them $50 and play that $3,000 guitar. $500 amp, you know. They don't realize that things have gone up. But anyway, we got to, we got luck in that was we got to hear everybody. Carl Perkins, Elvis, that's where we first saw Elvis. He appeared at Portage Rooftop, three pieces, him, Bill Black, and Scotty Moore, and never heard nothing like it. It was about, uh, I was out there that night. I was trying to play then. Went out there and I never heard nothing like it in my life. He, but anyway, he didn't have a huge crowd. I like we got here, but it's like the word gets around Newport. 
never gal down on front of over in the front street. By the second show had showed up, the place was full of money. The next time, Porky brought him back, he brought him out to Silver Moon. He was with Wanda Jackson. Bud Deckham, a guy over in Arkansas, they had a big hit record called Daydreaming. How many of them that? Mike Riley. Thank you, Mike. Anyway, he's, uh, he was from uh, over there. But anyway, Wanda Jackson, you talk about somebody who looked good. Elvis was after everybody else in the house. She had a white dress on and said, said her mama made it for it. And had this long six inch fringe. All of them down there. She'd get to shake it before that fringe. Elvis chased her all night. Uh, back when the Echo Sonic Amplifiers came out, uh, I think they made 66 of them, I think. 65. Yeah, I think Chet Atkins maybe got the first one, and then maybe Scotty Moore. And uh, Carl Perkins bought one. Or Roy Orbison had one. Anyway, uh, I asked Carl one that if he'd sell that out for it. He said, yeah. And I said, how about you take for it? He said, I'll take $300 for it. Hell, that's like $10,000 back then. He, he paid 600 for it. Anyway, I drove to Jackson, Tennessee and, and bought it from him. And uh, Sonny recorded a lot with it. But I kept playing the gig. Well, Bob Kern and I, along with John Ray and Russ Smith, our original bass or drummer, went up to Bob King's and Mike's Club. They were about, what, a half a mile apart on the highway, Rock and Roll Highway 67. And uh, Bob gave us a job. We couldn't get in the Silver Moon because they wanted a horn. At that time, we didn't have a horn. So we went up there, and Bob paid us, on Friday nights, Bob paid us uh, $10 a piece. That's $40. We go down on Saturday night, we drive down to Mike's there, $10 a piece. That's $40. But I was working at the box factory for $45. Week, I took out five dollars in taxes, so I'd make it as much in what? So we played uh, four hours then in each club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there when Elvis had played the Moon, he offered me and uh, Bobby Caldwell a job. Of course, uh, Elvis didn't, didn't mean all that much to me. I knew he was going to be famous, you know. But I told him, I said, "Now, why would I want to play for you when I'm already making forty-five dollars a week?" And <laughs> <laughs> tell me, he said. Oh man, you're good as Scotty Moore. There wasn't nobody as good as Scotty Moore. I don't care who they are. He created a guitar sound that nobody else ever played, ever came up with. Like Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee comes along with that piano and nothing like it. And it was just, I guess it was magic back then. Sam Phillips had, it was a genius. Most people don't realize that, how it's called at one time. And from 55 to about, till he decided he lost interest, about 58, and turned it over some different, well, him and Jack Clemens got into it, and Jack quit. But anyway, Sam had the biggest artists in the world. He stopped and figured them out. Carl Perkins, a million dollar quartet. He had those guys right there, but he had a lot of us, other guys that were doing pretty good in the music business too. We weren't millionaires. And Elvis wasn't until he went with R.C. and Victor and hit it big, but Sam had those guys. And Nashville actually hated Memphis because of Sam Phillips. He had the, he had the start. Everybody wanted to record down here in this little studio. I'm not, you know, Conway Twitty, Harold Jenkins recorded there. Norbert Phelps going to be here tonight recorded there. They didn't get released except in outtakes that uh, Charlie records in England put out back in the 70s and 80s. But uh, it's everybody wanted to come here and record. And Sam had the touch. I remember one time we played uh, at the Hotel Peabody, Tennessee School of Dentistry. And we had just ordered these suits out of New York. And they were blue and then back this red coat that I wore is over here in this museum somewhere over here. But anyway, yeah, yeah, FedEx, and it's, it's, it's over there at the museum. But any, anyway, we thought we were really dressed. So we 
walk in and here's all these bellhops wearing the exact same outfit. <laughs> Except they had this Philip Morris hat on, you know. So we took a, a break and I come downstairs, here comes this woman called and I'm right said, Young man, would you take my wedge up the room so and so? <laughs> yeah, I probably made more money with that. I don't know. You know, when you're fooling around then with people like Elvis, Carl, and all those guys, and we were as good as they were. Back then, the original Blazers had the best show group that ever came out of this part of the world. I'd like to play it against the Rolling Stones back in the 50s, like they are, well, not now, but when they were hot. Uh, we had to give them a run for the money. Nobody, nobody beat us on that stage. Our music wasn't the greatest because we were playing for the audience. Like if you were sitting out there in the audience, that was the audience. Like Sam Phillips, we recorded Ready and Warm We on a Boogie. People thought we were drunk when they listened to the record. It's not a great record, but it sold a lot of records. But we had never been in the studio before. We weren't drunk, we were scared. We didn't know what to do. Sam just sat up there and said, well, let's try it again. Red Ed Woman came out in uh, Jan what, January or February of uh, 56. Uh, the Glenn Miller Orchestra played the Silver Moon. Now those big orchestras would hit between St. Louis and Dallas. They would play the Silver Moon. Silver Moon had a lot of gambling, so they needed people to come out and cover up their gambling. Well, anyway, we got to open for that bunch. I mean, we'll get that ball. We thought it was really high cotton in. We got to, and while we were playing, about three or four of those musicians, orchestra, super band, came up and started playing with us. So that's another good memory. Awesome. When he traveled with us, getting a five dollar roll with him, he'd ride with us. We had a Cadillac limousine, and he'd ride with us, and he never offered to buy any gas. He'd, we picked him up here once in Memphis, in front of the Sun Studio, and he left his car there, and he had a convertible to come back. Somebody had cut the top and got everything out. That's the question I've had asked more than any other question: What was it like? to record in some studio with Sam Phillips here. And it was like sheer terror part of the time and being really exhilarating. You know, when we did Red Headed Woman, Sam accepted us to show the kind of uh, exuberance if you'd have 5,000 people out there. We were jumping and bucking around there. You, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, five, six guys and there would, would act that way making the recording. I guess it showed them the recording though. They said the thing would sound real wild, you know. But that's what he expected. He expected you to put out your best you have. And you better not sit in there with a frown on your face. You better be laughing and having a good time. Yeah, it's about Wanda Jackson. Yeah. We was playing a show with her in Jackson, Tennessee about 10 years ago. We were going to back her. And uh, she cut down on that Elvis Presley one night with you. We got to go on real good. <laughs> She jumped on Sonny and said, y'all breaking time and all that. And Sonny said, well, I know what we'll get. He said, Wanda, he said, what in the hell do you think that Elvis Presley got that song? And he, she said, what? And Sonny said, he got it from me. He heard me sing it. And he put it out. She didn't say much after that. <laughs> he, act, he actually covered our original version of it on one of his albums. You know, they changed it to One Night With You because One Night of Sin, they couldn't play on the radio back then. Think of that. Can you imagine that? One Night of Sin and the stuff they got on radio and TV nowadays. And they were hollering about that. But that changed. It's a guy out of New Orleans actually wrote it and recorded it. Who? Yeah. Smiley Lewis. You're right. Radio man. You're Smiley Lewis. He's yeah, he had that and uh, Going Home, another song we recorded of his. He was like Fats Domino and all the other New Orleans artists. Big band, but he never did it. <laughs> 